Well, good evening, uh, fellows, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Um, and uh, very good to see something in turnout for uh, St. Andrew's Day. Happy St. Andrew's Day. And uh, I hope you all have managed to find your way located to this uh, venue. Um, I hope that uh, the tribulations involved will be worthwhile. Very many thanks to uh, Tomatin uh, Distillery, who have provided some entertainment for us with nibbles, you'd be glad to know, uh, by special uh, request uh, after the meeting, which I hope will not uh, go on and on too long. So, um, is there any other business that people want to um, uh, bring to our attention before we go on to the, uh, the rest of the meeting? The music. Oh, the music, yes, yeah, good idea. Uh, can get... Andrea, can you ask them to turn the music off in there? Okay, so we can move on then to approve the minutes of the last uh, lecture meeting on the 13th of November. I'd like to, uh, our director to read the minutes. <laughs> this is good, isn't it? <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, good. Great start. Okay. Uh, welcome, uh, fellows and guests. Uh, the minutes of the meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland held at 6 p.m. in the auditorium NMS on Monday, 13th November 2017. David Caldwell, President of the Society, in the chair. The minutes of the last meeting were read and approved, and the following communication was read. From, from banditry to books, from reaving to screaving, the borders enlightenment, by Professor Ted Cowan. The same communication was read at 6.30pm on Wednesday, the 15th of November, in Dumfries Museum in Dumfries. May I sign that as a correct uh, record of the meeting? Yeah, that sounds like yes to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, okay. So we come round now to the uh, closure of the ballots. So if any of you um, are still to place your, your ballot papers in the ballot box, could you do so now? Um, any still to go in the ballot box? One. Okay, thank you. So in that case, um, the uh, ballot is now closed. Um, so do we have any scrutineers? Anybody like to be a scrutineer? Yes. Um, two of them. Yes, John yes, and Graham. John and Graham. Thank you very much, John and Graham. So if, if you could uh, remove the, the box and uh, check the results. Thank you very much. So, uh, now to receive the Treasurer's annual report. Um, can I ask um, the Treasurer, uh, Stephen? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Everybody, I'm Stephen Carter, the Treasurer of the Society. Um, I'm here this afternoon to report on the financial affairs of the Society for the year ending the 31st of May 2017. Um, all trustees of the Society are ultimately responsible um, for the proper running of the Society's financial affairs, but as Treasurer, I do have a particular interest and in take the lead in this area. And as in previous years, um, I'm largely reporting on work done by others, so I think it's probably appropriate to make some acknowledgements um, at, uh, at this point. Um, among the staff, I particularly wish to thank Simon Gilmore, the director, and Jan Patterson, the finance manager, who are jointly responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the Society's finances. We also benefit from some very competent external advisors and I wish to thank our auditors, Henderson Loggy 
and our investment manager at Investec. And I think our investment manager, Kate Brown, deserves a particular mention um, this year because of the additional work she's done in the restructuring of the society's investments over the past year. And that's been a particularly helpful contribution from her. So I'll start my report by dealing with the abbreviated counts, which you should all have a copy. And it's this two-sided white sheet. So if, if you want to refer to it, then now's the time to, to get it out. So I'll introduce the information in those abbreviated accounts, and then at the end, I'll talk a little more about two topics that are related to the content of the abbreviated accounts. For those of you that are regulars um, to these anniversary meetings, you should recognise the format of the accounts. It's not changed in recent years. And it comprises two main things. The first is the statement of financial activities, which is the first side, the full sheet of figures. And then on the reverse, the rather shorter balance sheet. So two components to the abbreviated accounts. If we look first at the statement of financial activities, you'll see that there are various columns, and just to quickly guide you through them so you know which column you need to be looking at, we have, starting from left to right, a breakdown of the results for the year in question. This is the year 2016 to 2017. So you'll see columns headed unrestricted general, unrestricted designated, and restricted, and they're the three divisions that we organise our affairs under. We then get a fourth column, which is the total of those first three for 2017. And then for comparative purposes, we have a column at the end there, on the right-hand side, the total for 2016. So the current figures <coughs> for the previous financial year. That should all be very familiar to you. And then in terms of the rows of the table, we first of all have the breakdown of the income, leading to a line at total income, a breakdown of expenditure, leading to a line at total expenditure, and then we have some adjustments we made based on the changing value of our investments, and then finally getting to the proverbial bottom line at the bottom. So that's the layout of those um, figures. Now, if we actually start at that bottom line, and I suppose the, the, the figure to, to look at is um, in the total for 2017, so that's the fourth column across. <coughs> and, and if we go to the bottom, we can see under the line net movement, which is the third figure up from the bottom, a figure of 228,000. And, and if we look for a single headline for the year, we have that positive movement in our funds, 228,000 pounds more, and that gives us at the very bottom of that column, um, a, a balance of our funds now of over £1.3 million. And if we compare that with the equivalent figures for the 2016 column, so this is right at the bottom right hand corner of the figures, we see a very similar increase um, of just over £200,000 in that year as well. Now, that all sounds very positive. Um, funds going up must be a good thing. It's very important to realise that for 2016 and for 2017, the funds have increased for very, very different reasons. And both those reasons are quite specific and arguably not directly connected with the work that we've been doing over the past year. So it's important to understand why they've gone up so much and, and uh, um, what the difference between the two years is. And in the case of 2016, for any of you that were here last year, you will remember that it reflects, by and large, the receipt of an extremely large legacy. So very much a one-off event, a very positive event, but um, a one-off event. In the case of 2017, the increase is almost entirely due to the value of our investments going up. That is, the stock market performed well over the 12 months of the financial year. Now, again, very welcome, but it is something that is essentially outside our control. We could easily have a year where the value of our investments goes down, again, through no direct activity in ourselves. So, 
In both the most recent years, very positive increases in our total funds, but we need to be aware that they're coming about because of these very specific external factors. So it's very important to distinguish between that sort of variable um, performance over the longer term for these external reasons and to look at the management of the society's annual budget, which is, I think, arguably uh, a more important reflection of the extent to which we're managing our finances correctly. And to look at this, we need to look in a little more detail at the income and expenditure figures for 2017. And here I'm going to look at the comparison between total um, unrestricted income and um, unrestricted expenditure. To do this, you need to go down to total expenditure, which is about the fifth line up from the bottom, the sixth line up from the bottom. And we see there that we have 388... No, that's the wrong number. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm confusing my figures here now. But if we go to total expenditure, we have £341,000 of total expenditure. We have the 317 to the 24000 And we compare that with total income unrestricted of 388. And that gives us, in unrestricted activities, apparently a surplus of £47,000. Now, if we take into account the fact that that includes legacy income of £33,000, effectively a one-off windfall. We can see that the surplus on unrestricted activities over the year is approximately £14,000. And that really is very close to um, a balanced budget. If we look at the same calculations for restricted income, the third column across, we see figures of £207,000 for income and £199,000 for expenditure, again, more or less in balance. And this is what we'd expect, particularly for restricted activities, where it is largely around project funding, where we both receive the income and spend that income within the current year. So, I think my message to you is that we have a small surplus overall, despite the headline figure of an excess of 200,000. What we're really looking at is a very small surplus overall. Our aim at the start of the year was to produce a balanced budget, and so I think the outcome is very satisfactory. It is hard to accurately predict at the start of the year all our income and expenditure. We would expect some variation. Some years that will lead to a, a small deficit, some years to a small surplus. This year, we have that small surplus. So, a positive outcome in line with our budget, and um, a one that I um, think is very satisfactory. Moving very briefly to the balance sheet on the back, I really want to pick up on a couple of points, um, largely by way of explanation. The first one is the change in the level of debtors between 2016 and 2017. If you look at the third, what is the third item down, debtors, you will see a figure of 348,000 in 2016, a figure of only 115,000 in 2017. And this is just to point out that the 348,000 figure in 2016 was an exceptionally high number. We're back down now to more typical levels. And in 2016, it reflected the fact that we had just received a large legacy. We just received notification of a large legacy, but we hadn't actually received it. So it was treated by the accountants as a debtor. So for technical reasons, it appeared there and led to this rather unusual figure in debtors. We're now back to more normal levels. So that, that's one thing to note. The other thing to note, and I'm going to come on to this in a minute when I talk at greater length about it, is to look at the, the distribution of our um, investments between the two unrestricted funds. And here you need to look down to the bottom of the table where you see a breakdown of unrestricted funds between general and designated. And if you look at those figures, for 2016 you'll see there was approximately 490,000 in the general fund, 580,000 in the designated, and in equivalent figures for 2017, both larger, but a very similar balance, 610 in the general, 688 in the designated. Now, for those of you who were here last year and, and, and knew that we were talking about um, redistributing the balance of our investments between those two funds, 
it's clear that that hadn't happened in these 2017 figures. And I'll come on to talk about that in a minute. But just to point out that for those of you who were expecting a change in those funds, that had not happened by the end of the 2016-17 financial year. So that's all I want to say specifically about the balance sheet. What I'd like to move on to now are two specific topics which are based on some of the information in the abbreviated accounts. The first of them is to give you an update on the reorganisation of the Society's investments, the topic I was just referring to there. And the second is to make a brief comment about the decline in subscription income between 2016 and 2017. First then, the reorganisation of the Society's investments. If you were here last year, you may remember me discussing the major legacy that the Society had received and the fact that its arrival had encouraged us to review how and why the Society holds funds in the long term. And I announced at that time that we decided to restructure the Society's unrestricted funds so that we could distinguish between funds that were held as a financial reserve and those that we could use um, to support our charitable aims. And at that time, we decided that the value of the reserve fund needed to be limited to 100 to 200,000, and all remaining unrestricted funds could be held in a designated fund and the investment um, and invested to generate income that could be used by society to fund either its own projects or to grant aid work by others. Now, at the time, we were investigating how the investment strategies for these two different funds could be differentiated to better serve their purposes. Once you've identified two different purposes for holding funds, it is possible, in principle, to find different investment strategies that better serve those aims. And we have now reached a decision that we wish to do that. The difference is not great, but in general terms, we've decided to accept a higher level of risk in the designated fund in the expectation that we will achieve higher returns on those investments in that fund. Now, the logic behind this reflects two facts. One is that the primary purpose of the designated fund is to generate income, and therefore we should be seeking to do that. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, because there should be no need to withdraw capital from that fund at short notice, we should be able to better accommodate poor performance in the fund in the short term, so the fluctuations, if you like, in its value, that are more likely to occur in the higher risk environment that we've decided that we're comfortable with. <coughs> so, a slight differentiation between the two funds, we're going to monitor the effect of this change in the strategy to see if it actually does deliver increased returns, and we'll keep this matter under annual review. Now, the knock-on effect of, of, of having made that decision is that um, we've now tasked our investment manager at Investec to redistribute the funds into these two pots, but she has also had to do a lot of reinvesting to meet the new strategy. So there's been a lot of selling and buying of new investments, and this has taken time. So, the effect has been to rather delay the process, hence it not appearing in the 2016-17 accounts, hence the fact that in the balance sheet, the funds have not yet shifted. That process has now happened, and so when we come to this time next year, you will see the effect of that new distribution. So that's my first topic. My second topic is subscription income. Now, if you, if you briefly look back at the statement of financial activities and go to the top, of the table, and the first line under income is subscriptions. You may have noticed, if you compare 2016 to 2017, there's been a decline in income from subscriptions from 204 to 181,000. Now, it's a relatively small decline, but nevertheless, it's one that I think at first sight is, is worrying because we place so much emphasis in recent years on increasing subscription income and put a lot of effort into promoting fellowship, and uh, it's therefore, uh, at first sight, um, a, a disconcerting result. So I did want to explore that a little bit and to understand why subscription income has declined. <coughs> now, as with all things, there isn't necessarily a single simple um, reason for this, but we think we can identify the principal reason, and that is about the changes we've made to the structure and types of subscription available to fellows. 
And specifically, we think it relates primarily to changes regarding subscriptions for retired fellows, or as they would be now referred to, those over 65. And, in addition, the removal of the rule that you would have had to be a fellow for 10 years in advance of that date to receive the benefit of reduced subscription. That is, there would have originally been a loyalty bonus. Now, with, with the simplification of the arrangements around retired fellowship, we've experienced a little rush. Effectively, a fellow's realising that they're 65. <laughs> and, and taking advantage of the revised arrangements for subscriptions. And this largely is the explanation for our decline in income. So there has been no decline in fellowship. In fact, has continued to rise slowly. But what's happened is that the amount of money we are receiving from each fellow has, in this case, gone down. Now, it's important that the subscription rates that we set are realistic and fair, and clearly we want to encourage people to join and remain fellows in the long term. So, we think that there's nothing wrong in principle with the decision we made to change arrangements for fellows over 65. I think that's fundamentally a good thing. And we suspect the decline we've seen here is a one off correction as we adjust the new system. However, we do need to keep a careful eye on subscription income. In the meantime, fellowship continues to rise, and that is good news for the long term health of the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, before I seek uh, approval for the report, are there any questions you would like to ask Stephen about it? Okay, right, thank you. So, could I have somebody to propose uh, adoption of the report, please? Thank you very much. And uh, seconder, uh, David at the back there. And um, approval, just a show of hands, but I do happy with it. Right, thank you very much indeed. Okay. So can we move on now to the director's act report and invite Simon to deliver that? <laughs> Dear fellows and guests, welcome. Okay, my name is Simon Gilmore, I'm the director of the Society. And uh, since we've started later than usual, I'll try and whiz through this as fast as I po possibly can. Um, and, but you will be um, able to quiz me afterwards uh, during the reception, or indeed immediately after the talk. So a quick reminder why we're here. The Society Charter of 1783 defines our broad remit which we've honed for the 21st century through the agreed strategic plan. <coughs> but at the centre of that plan is you, it's the fellowship. Without you, the society can't exist. And it's without, with your support that the society is able to do so much, so well. Without your support, it would lose its independence and meaning. And this evening, I want to focus on what the society has been doing over the last year with the support of, and focused on, the fellowship and the colleagues that we have across Scotland and further afield. So I begin with one of our more recent accomplishments, the launch of the Edinburgh Hallmarked Solid Silver Pin Badge, uh -huh. <laughs> designed by Karen Wallace and inspired by the Society Seal, and made possible through the help of our fellow, Colin Fraser. And these are yours for only £40, available tonight, without post and packaging, They'll be, they, uh, but the funds from these help generate uh, uh, more uh, activity to the society. It allows us to undertake our charter activities. And already, fellows across the globe have begun to purchase these symbols of solidarity with the society's aims, and it makes for an excellent Christmas gift. <laughs> and I, by the way, it is very much inspired by our seal. It is not meant to replicate our, our, our society seal. Charles. <laughs> okay. So, fellows represent an incredibly wide range of antiquarian interests in Scotland's past, both in terms of their subject interest or their capacity for engagement. 
In a recent blog on our website, in the news pages, Jill Turnbull, author of From Goblets to Gaslights, our excellent book on Scottish glass, provided a fantastic consideration of the term amateur as one who cultivates anything as a pastime. And many of our fellows have little time to directly engage with the society, but through their membership, they support what we do. We're proud to be expanding the range of people involved as fellows of our society, and indeed, in a recent letter to me, which also included a very welcome and sizable donation, hint, hint, highlighted, and I quote, this blend of professionals and volunteers supports the society and gives it life and outreach. I hope that this may continue. And I can only say here, here to that. <coughs> the introduction of a student or young fellow subscription has been successful in attracting more early career and younger amateur 21st century antiquarians to society, some of whom are here tonight, I noticed. Very good. And we want to extend our fellowship further and wider than ever before, but we can't do it without you. Please consider nominating friends and colleagues who are interested in Scotland's past to fellowship, and we'll all make them feel very welcome. We'll welcome them to our range of events, now starting to grow across the globe with the success of the United States and Australian Fellows Annual Dinners, organised by our Honorary Secretaries, and a proposal to develop another international conference abroad, probably with the University of Guelph in Ontario in 2019, ten years after our successful venture to Winterthur in Philadelphia. Many events are crucially supported through grants and sponsorship, and I'd like to take the opportunity tonight to thank some of those who make these collegiate events possible. Historic Environment Scotland support a lot of what we do, and I'm afraid you'll hear we thank them a lot tonight. For example, they grant aided the ARP 2017 conference alongside a list of other sponsors, including Guard Archaeology, University of Aberdeen, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, AOC Archaeology, and Current Archaeology, the magazine. And I always see getting such widespread support for ARP important not only to ensure the event happens and that it's uh, affordable, but as evidence that it is still considered an important part of the Scottish archaeological calendar and when people can catch up on the most recent research out there. Historic Environment Scotland also lent their support to the day seminar on Scotland's earliest people, their landscapes and houses, which we held in honour of our past president, Alan Savile. And I also thank Transport Scotland for grant support for that same event. Wessex Archaeology not only sponsored the event, but helped develop its content and present it. Investec Wealth and Investment, already mentioned by Stephen, supported an evening event earlier this year, and will do so again in January next year. So keep an eye on your email inboxes for further information on that. And also potentially becoming an annual event is the Scottish Auction Preview with Lionel Turnbull, which included three short presentations from fellows. And we must also thank the Strathmartin Trust this year for once again supporting the Lindsay Fisher Lectures and allowing us to take this unique lecture to Kirkwall. This year, we're also able to introduce the newly renamed National Trust of Norway to the National Trust for Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland, which will hopefully generate greater communications between Norway and Scotland on the back of the Lindsay Fisher Lectures. One event we have yet to secure sponsorship or external support for is the Summer Excursion, an annual opportunity for fun, education and informal discussion. We have up to now relied on fellows and guests to cover the full cost of a wee day out to visit Scotland's historic places with expert guides. But perhaps this is another area we could consider expanding. There has been some interest in taking the excursion further afield over a longer period in future. And perhaps it's something we could tempt fellows and organisations to sponsor in the future. <coughs> perhaps, please let us know your thoughts on this. And of course, any offers of financial or in-kind support are always welcome. I'd like to thank AOC Archaeology, who have continued to support the Rhine Lectures, presented so eloquently by Professor Gilchrist this year. Now, next year's uh, Rhine Lectures will be supported by Tomat and Distillers, hopefully with match funding from Arts and Business Scotland, if our application is successful. Tomatin have also provided fellows with a discount code with which to get £6 off a bottle of the Integrate Whiskey until the end of December. Another perfect Christmas gift. <laughs> Historic Environment Scotland 
alongside Museums Gallery Scotland, fund our SCARF project, which is now focused on delivering research benefits to regional areas across Scotland and museums. Aligned with Scotland's archaeology strategy, it still relies on collaborative networks of fellows and colleagues to define what it is we want to know about Scotland's past. And only now it's trying to engage with a wider audience at a more local level. Historic Environment Scotland, again, have also continued to support projects like Dig It, uh, which has flourished in this year of history, heritage and archaeology, delivering not only the Scotland in Six uh, events on World Heritage Day, but also the Inspired Hidden Gems campaign, which saw over 12,000 votes cast to determine which six places won a bespoke event during Scottish Archaeology Month, all while continuing to promote and support heritage events across the year. The six winners, by the way, just in case you were wondering, were Govan Stones, Ardrossan Castle, James Watts Cottage, The Howth, Cameltown Picture House, and the Including Collegiate Church, all of which are well worth a visit. And Diggett also saw fantastic support from Events Scotland throughout this year of history, heritage, and archaeology. Oops. Fellows and colleagues continue to support our publications as authors grant providers and enthusiastic consumers of books and articles on Scotland's past. Please feel free to consume more and support the Society this evening when books will be on sale during the reception afterwards. Historic Environment Scotland again support a wealth of articles and book production, but others also regularly support the open access publication of articles in the proceedings and sale, such as Forestry Commission Scotland and the various developers who employ archaeologists through the planning process. Now, this latter is often seen as simply fulfilling a regulation requirement, but the Society is keen to highlight that in so doing, they are funding the creation of new knowledge on Scotland's past, and making it free and easily available to all. Our next book publication is due in early 2018 by Roger Mercer, an honorary fellow and ex-president of the Society, and will present the results of one of the few major research ex exercises into the prehistory of southwest Scotland, we look forward to launching this in 2018 and we'll be taking advance orders soon. And our next, so we're currently progressing um, our development of online platforms for publishing and currently exploring a potential partnership with colleagues in the Edinburgh University Library as part of the Scottish Digital Library Consortium with a, a possible <coughs> online platform. I simply reiterate here our support for open access, especially to our fellows and colleagues in academia just as the Research Excellence Framework starts to pull together its assessment panels for 2021. We're a good place to publish. This year, the Grants and Awards Committee were able to offer over £16,000 to deserving projects of all types, from excavations and surveys to historical research into Cold War spies and World War II Lapland. However, despite there now being twice as much funding available, we received only 21 applications seeking over £25,000, which was substantially reduced from previous years. You want to tell you why? Since today was a deadline for applications, I don't know exactly how many we'll get this year. Um, there'll be more trickling into my inbox all the way through this meeting. Um, and I'll only know when we get back to work tomorrow. But I suspect it might be around the same amount. So, if there is money there, please do make applications. We've completed yet another busy year of activity. Tonight, the next proceedings is available digitally, and those relative few who have opted for a hard copy will receive them as a Christmas gift in December. We hope to end the year on a high with the long anticipated move of the Edinburgh Runestone from its current location behind bars below the Castle Esplanade to a more accessible location outside 50 George Square. And this has been made possible thanks to Edinburgh World Heritage Trust and the Heritage Lottery Fund for. for uh, uh, grant aiding uh, the project, but also uh, the uh, help of uh, friends, colleagues, fellows in the National Museum of Scotland, where we'll be transferring uh, ownership of, of the uh, stone, and of course fellows and colleagues in the City of Edinburgh Council and the University of Edinburgh. The National Museum of Scotland, of course, deserve our gratitude not only for housing the staff of the society, but in the behind the scenes and not so behind the scenes efforts um, that fellows and colleagues make to add value to fellowship, 
So just this afternoon, for example, our fellow Mark Lancy and his research library co colleagues were displaying society treasures from the archive in advance of the anniversary meeting. And they did the same after the joint NMS event on Egypt and Rhymed in May. And we continue to retain a close relationship with the museum research library throughout the year, and I encourage fellows to use it as much as possible. In delivering <coughs> such a smorgasbord of activity, I must thank my team, the staff of the Society, who often go above and beyond the call of duty to ensure that the Society keeps an even keel, and that high quality looks effortless, well, kind of, despite me, I suppose, and that everyone is made to feel welcome and engaged with a thriving and successful charitable organisation. And I must especially thank Rosa Dimitrelli, who has now moved on to work in the University of Edinburgh, but who served the Society admirably uh, through her time with us, and welcome her replacement, Charlotte Whiting, who you will have uh, the opportunity to meet this evening and over many coming years, I hope. But it's the fellowship that provides our cherished independence and ensures that we have the best advice and expertise around us. So I have a couple of favours to ask of you. The first is for opinions and ideas on how the society can better support and deliver our own charitable aims and the aims of the archaeology strategy, uh, whether through things like the archaeology strategy or the wider historic environment strategy at our place in time, or the currently developing culture strategy for Scotland. Um, are there things that we can do more of, that we can do differently, or completely different things entirely that we, have, we, that we can consider doing in the future? And also, yes, I'll ask again, can you support us financially? As a charity, the more we have in our bank or investments, the more we can do for the heritage of Scotland. Sponsorship can help make knowledge affordable through reduced price or free entry to events. It can provide free access to published material. It can deliver added value, such as the recording of our events. And it can release funds to other areas of society activity. And importantly, it provides a very tangible and clear expression of support for Scotland's past. I've tried to emphasise throughout this report the support and breadth of interest of our fellows. And with your help, we can provide the funds to enable research in Scotland's past. We can support the dissemination of the research and we can help promote the benefits of that research to an increasing audience. We'd like to do more of everything. More and bigger grants, more free access to information and new things, some that we haven't even thought of yet. So help us take the society and its 21st century antiquarians confidently into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, so before uh, we look for approval of the, uh, Simon's paper, are there any questions or comments from So could we have uh, somebody propose adoption of Simon's report? Yes. <coughs> and a seconder. Thank you. Thank you. And could we have a show of hands? Thank you very much indeed. So moving on now to the uh, presentation of the RBK Stevenson Award. Um, Robert Stevenson was a very distinguished uh, keeper of the National Museum of Antiquities of Scotland and he was president of the society between 1975 and 1978. Um, a great scholar, polymath, great deal of different interests and uh, an award of £50 is offered uh, for the article published in the proceedings on a topic that best reflects the scholarship and high standards uh, of RBK Stevenson. And I'm delighted to say that uh, this year uh, we are making an award to Daniel Rhodes and Elizabeth Jones for the paper titled Kissed Behind the Bins, the excavation of an Iron Age kiss burial at the House of the Bins. Bless you. So, we have um, Daniel here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So 
that comes round to the, um, the President's uh, address. Um, it's me, David Caldwell. Serving as a society's president is a great honour and responsibility. I've also enjoyed doing so. It is, however, with some diffidence that I accepted the view of my fellow trustees that I should put myself forward for a second term of office. The changes to our management structure agreed immediately prior to my taking on the role of president three years ago specifically allowed for this to happen. It was the hope of council at that time that a longer period in office could allow a president to see through projects that by their nature extended over several years. At this time, a major concern to the council continues to be adequate accommodation for our staff and appropriate space to carry out our activities, matters which I touched on in my presidential address a year ago. Let me say at this point that we're very grateful to the National Museum of Scotland for its continued recognition of the special relationship between it and us due to our shared origins and also for providing us with a home. The museum director, Gordon Rintoul, and all his staff have been very supportive of our activities and we greatly appreciate the many ways they have helped us and enabled our events. We live, however, in a changing world. The Council has ambitions to keep the society in the forefront of Scottish antiquarianism and to develop new opportunities and services for all our fillers. Even if we as a society were to wish only to stand still, we could not assume that circumstances beyond our control would allow us to do so. This particularly applies to accommodation. We frankly need better, and we cannot assume that the museum will be able to support us forever, even at the current level. Council has therefore established a working group to review accommodation options and to seek out best advice on how we might proceed. We hope that it will be possible to identify one or more proposals for action to put to fellows within the next three years. Time for adequate questions and explanations at a meeting like this is rather limited, but please do engage when I am finished. As ever, we would be very happy to hear outside this meeting any time from any of you if you feel you have anything to say that, we might, that might help us achieve our goals. You could contact either me or uh, Simon Gilmore in the first instance. Coming back to society events over the last year, I am pleased that we have continued to offer a broad range of meetings and topics, not just in Edinburgh and Aberdeen, but elsewhere in Scotland as well. In this last year, we, we had lectures delivered in our name in Inverness, Cripball, and Dumfries. Ayrshire Archaeological and Natural History Society was a recipient of our Buckingham Lecture Award, which enabled Caroline Ripley Jones to speak in air on the Olympic Orkney. The Society tries in its lectures program to reflect the full range of antiquarian research being undertaken in Scotland and bring to you the most exciting, recent and innovative work, as well as reviews and studies of topics and projects which have been with us for a long time. This last year, you will recall that they ranged over subjects as diverse as digital mapping of Edinburgh by Professor Richard Roger to the identification by Dr. Ruth Siddle of pigment used in Roman paintings. In June, we welcomed Professor Margaret Stang to give the Lindsay Fisher lecture on the subject of medieval painted vaults in Norwegian parish churches. Do tell us if there are speakers and subjects that you think we should be featuring. Our prestigious series of Rhine lectures were given this last year by Professor Roberta Gilchrist of Reading University on the archaeology of medieval beliefs. Her lectures were well attended by an audience of fellows and guests who greatly appreciated a thought-provoking and well-researched topic delivered in a, in a pleasing manner. The Archaeological Research in Progress Conference held jointly with Archaeology Scotland in the National Museum here in Edinburgh was as ever an impressive demonstration of the range of work and research being undertaken in Scotland by, by academics, amateurs and commercial units across the sector. An additional conference of particular importance and interest to many of us was a conference in Edinburgh in June 
on recent research in the Paleolithic and Mesolithic in Scotland, celebrating the achievements and interests of my predecessor as president, the late Alan Sarrell. In January, a pleasant wine reception was laid on for fellows by Investment Wealth and Investment in the Redmond office, a great opportunity for several of us to meet and chat. And in August, we had a welcome return to Wine and Tumbles Auction House, a chance to view the lots being sold in their forthcoming Scottish sale, enjoy short presentations on Scottish glass, silver and pottery, and sip wine in congenial circumstances. Um, sipping drink is a, is a theme here, and I hope you'll appreciate it later this evening. And it is something I've touched upon in the past. I mean, we, we are a society, and I think it is important for us to, to have the opportunity to actually socialise and, and uh, talk uh, together. The Society's Council is keen to extend the range and location of society events, both in Scotland and elsewhere. We have active groups of fellows in Australia and North America, both of which are supported by secretaries, fellows James Donaldson and Holtfield Anderson. Last year, I drew attention to the steps taken by the Society to encourage our younger fellows. This year, it is a pleasure to record our appreciation of the support of uh, 58 fellows who have been with us for 50 or more years. You saw some of them at the beginning the gold badge holders. Um, and um, as a gesture of uh, appreciation and to reflect the evident mood amongst the wider fellowship that such long service should be recognised, Council decided that all fellows of 50 years standing should be awarded a gilt version of the Society's pin badge. The gold badge, as you saw, glinting in the photograph. Um, on. It is good to report that this gesture has been rewarded by letters and emails expressing thanks and satisfaction. And indeed, I think this is a, a good opportunity for us to express our uh, appreciation again in a round of applause to uh, Seth Phillips. The governance of the society remains in the hands of a small group of trustees elected by you, the fellowship. In, re in recommending and encouraging fellows to stand, and on occasion courting trustees to fill gaps, we make conscious decisions to represent the whole Scottish antiquarian world in its diversity and geographical spread, whilst also actively looking for the necessary expertise to run a modern business in all its complexity. It is, no, it, it is no small ask to have your trustees, to a man and woman, busy individuals in other areas of work, keep up with all the paperwork produced by the society as a business and attend council, committee and other meetings. I have nothing but admiration and thanks, but they not only do so, but they participate with passion and knowledge. The running of the society is carried out by uh, a dedicated staff, and our director, Simon Gilmore, has already expressed his appreciation of all we do, with which uh, I totally concur. But it's a pleasure also for me to record my thanks and appreciation to Simon for all his hard work in ensuring the smooth running of the society. The society owes a great deal to Simon uh, for managing our affairs and staff representing us and our interests on and to several other bodies, supporting me and the other trustees. It has been a pleasure to work with him and the rest of our staff. We continue to benefit from the backing and generosity of sponsors, uh, notably Sir Angus Grossert, uh, for supporting our lecture series and enabling the professional recording of our lectures, AOC Archaeology Limited for the Ryan Lectures, I've already mentioned Lion and Tumble and Investic, and we have also now received most welcome support in kind from Taunton Distant Company, Company Limited. And you can tell by my voice that it can't come soon enough. <laughs> <coughs> the Society continues to rely on the, the subscription of fellows as its main source of income, however. 
But there is clearly virtue in finding other sources of funding to help expand our activities. And a priority, as Simon said, remains increased funding for research. Uh, let me just finish by saying there is no donation too small nor time too inconvenient for us to accept it. Thank you very much. We thought it would be, um, I, I will take questions, uh, but we thought it would be um, a good um, thing, especially when we're recalling um, so many good fellows uh, of the past and the ones who are still with us, just to remind ourselves of um, fellows who have uh, passed away and just have uh, a few moments of silence just to think on, um, on that. So, any, any comments or questions you, you want to, to ask of me? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the uh, results of the, the ballots, and thank you very much indeed to uh, John and Graham. And the, the ballot for the election of Phyllis, uh, first of all, um, there were 14 uh, votes in favour and none against. So I can declare that uh, all the applications um, have been um, um, accepted and we have uh, 125 new fillers to welcome. Um, so congratulations uh, to all of them. And do we have uh, some of these uh, applicants here tonight? Can we, can we have you stand up or... <laughs> Good to see all of you here tonight. Uh, it'd be nice to talk to you later on. And if you could all just wait behind immediately after this uh, formal business part, uh, and we'll get a photograph uh, of, of you all. Um, that would be really good. Um, Oh yes, uh -huh. right. And we have the and we have the results of the uh, of the ballot for council trustees. There were um, forty votes in favour and two against. So I can announce that uh, all the office bearers who were all the trustees were up for election uh, have been duly elected. So thank you very much indeed. I mentioned in my uh, talk um, how appreciative I was of the, of the hard work uh, of uh, trustees, the commitment uh, that they, they give over the years, and uh, at this time it's particularly appropriate to, to record the, uh, the efforts, the support of uh, Dr Adeline Wilson and Dr Anne Groundwater, uh, who retired in the course of the year. Though in the case of Adeline, it's um, good to say that uh, she is continuing her involvement uh, with our um, Aberdeen committee, and uh, we're very grateful for that. Uh, it's also a pleasure to welcome again uh, Dr. Stephen Carter, re-elected as treasurer. Congratulations, Stephen. <laughs> uh, and uh, newly, newly elected council trustee, uh, Dr. Hector McQueen. Don't think Hector's here tonight. Um, and also to welcome Ian McDowell and uh, Dr. Van Maxwell as elected trustees. They were uh, previously Clopton trustees. So thank you very much indeed for that. So is there any other uh, competent business that you would like to raise? No. Okay. Well, that leads me to um, the, uh, the, the final event, um, which is the uh, presentation by uh, Peter Yeoman on Columbus Heavenly House. 
Um, Peter will be, be well known to you as a, as a very experienced um, uh, archaeologist uh, who worked as a, for, for five, as, a, as a five archaeologist and latterly for HES um, and has uh, published widely uh, an explanatory book on uh, medieval archaeology in Scotland and also uh, another one on uh, pilgrimage. Um, his talk tonight, uh, I think, is, is probably a spin off from some of the work that he, he did um, for uh, HES on redeveloping the displays on Iona, but very much forward to him, Stephen. Yeah. Peter. <laughs> Sarah thought, oh my goodness, what's going to come next? And he leaned in to Sarah 
and say, well, I wish you'd bloody stay there. <laughs> so this underpins the travels of Columba. And the travels of Columba as a saint, key, of course, during his life, where he sets up a great uh, a confederation of monasteries in Scotland and Ireland, but also, and in some ways more importantly, his travels in death, because, of course, a saint really enters into his, the key stage of his life on the day that he dies. And that's how we've come to uh, understand the uh, uh, veneration of the saint across Europe, which was something that we couldn't quite understand um, before. And so, the Holy House of my title is the, 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 the Heavenly House, is the House Shaped Triumph. You all, a lot of you are very familiar with the Monimus reliquary. Uh, this great, you can hold it in the palm of your hand, it's enormous up on the screen, if you can see it by the Christmas tree. And uh, one of these appears in this portrait of St. Columba, the oldest portrait of St. Columba, which is on the back page of this Carolingian copy of his life created in the great monastery of St. Gallen. And of course, Columba, our national patron saint, before the cult of Andrew took over. And uh, the, the portrait appears in this manuscript book, um, created at and still existed within the great monastery of uh, St. Gallen in, in Switzerland. So we've got a, a timeline which is 597. Columba dying and being buried in Iona, by which time uh, somebody who'd been very heavily influenced by him, another great monastic figure, Columbanus, from Bangor in County Down, had started this great tradition of peregrinati, of the Irish and Scots monks travelling for various reasons through Europe, establishing networks of, of Irish and Irish leaning monasteries across the continent, something that went on for hundreds of years. 697, 100 years after his death, Abbot Adelmon uh, writing the life, uh, which in three, it was basically three books of the miracles of, of Columba, which had enormous influence across the continent. And this uh, uh, copy has been made in the Irish Scriptorium. Lots of copies had to be made. They had each of the uh, monasteries in the uh, 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 confederation. Uh, needed to have a copy, and one of these by a monk who signed it, called Dorbury, made its way um, across Europe to eventually uh, end up, first of all, in Germany, um, and uh, then being lent to San Gal to be copied. And that happened in about 850, and about 50 years later, this back page was, was added. And, uh, and, and then another key date is 1857, when William Reeves in Dublin published his first transliteration of the original Iona copy of the life, which is the only complete copy of the original life uh, which, which survives today. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next 15 minutes. Um, and this research was made possible by an Angus Graham Award from the Society, which allowed me to travel to the San Gallen Stiff's Bibliotheque in 2014 um, to examine the, the Codex, uh, which is in the catalogue of San Gallen 555, copy of the life. And uh, all, of course, all the early medieval codices from Europe are available online. So some people would say, well, why on earth did you have to go all the way to have a look at it? Um, but there, you know, anybody who deals with the materiality of objects, and as an archaeologist, that's what I do, and that's what this talk is about, it's about materiality. Um, that seeing the thing, holding the thing in the flesh is, uh, 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 it, you, you simply can't do without it. And so much of what I've discovered, and what I'll be talking about in a minute, came from that, and not from looking at it online. But you can look at it online, and it's very nice it is too. And these results are now published in the, in the proceedings, uh, out today in a, in a paper. And uh, something else that's happened is that the significance of the, the, the research has been picked up by our other fellow, Professor Jane Geddes, uh, Professor of History of Art in the University of Aberdeen. And uh, she's going to take up with another paper where I've left off an art historical analysis of the same image. 
uh, which will be published as a, a part of our paper in the proceedings next year. And the Redisplay project, um, which kicked all of, all of this off uh, out on, on, on Iona. Um, and it was during this that I was looking for images. I'm, in, in creating, this is a new museum of the high crosses on Iona, it, it was very, very important for me to be able to identify images. And I, so that's what set me off on this track, to find the oldest image of St. Colombo, which wasn't really established. And um, so I saw Reed's copy uh, of this, the image from San Gal in uh, his 1857 book. We talked to Professor Richard Sharp in Oxford about this. He, he, he published the great um, Penguin classic. Uh, a, a translation of the life of, of Columbo. And, and he made it clear to me that nobody had ever really looked at the, at the drawing before. Um, so I set about having, uh, uh, examining it to, to see what, uh, what it could tell us. Uh, hopefully, I was hopeful that it would tell us something about um, Columbo and Leona. Well, I was rather foolish in doing that, but it told us something much more important in a way it told us about Columba in the uh, Merovingian and, and Carolingian uh, continental uh, context. And here is, here is the image here with my, that, that's the original on the left hand side, it's tiny, it's a, a tiny less, a smaller, half the size of A4, uh, added, as I say, to the back page of a copy of the life. Uh, made at St. Gallen in the scriptorium, and my redrawing of it over on that side, and what I've circled is the key thing. When I started looking at it and hoping that the image was going to tell me something about Columba and, and Iona, which it doesn't, um, but I looked at the shelf <coughs> above the altar to his, to his side, and it struck me that these look, well, the one on the left looks very much like an insular house shaped track, like the one in Australia, or more likely uh, the Bologna um, house shaped shrine, or indeed another missing house shaped shrine. And there are some other key objects there as well. Um, so, so, this, the other factor here is an extraordinary interrelationship and a key aspect of doctrine within the church which was that wherever the saint was and here's the saint and um, wherever the saint was uh, uh, sorry wherever his bones were so there was the saint wherever the relics were the saint was there as well this concept of, of being present at his shrine and the saint in the image is standing beside what i think is the house shaped shrine which had been transported from Ireland or Scotland with relics of Columba to stand in a uh, little shrine chapel within the 9th century church of, of St. Gallo, uh, a shrine chapel dedicated to Columba. And of course, the monk who made the drawing would draw the saint as being physically present there. The uh, manuscripts written in Latin, Carolingian script, probably uh, by 850, and it was well used in the library, um, being mentioned repeatedly in later catalogues, demonstrating a long lasting devotion to the saint. Um, the illustrations on the last page, two pages after the end, and clearly added at a, a later date, and Jane Geddes has suggested about 900. The saint stands central to and almost filling the round arch round-headed arch, um, presumably representing the entry to his side chapel. He's uh, shown standing in the Oran's position, and he's standing on a rocky hill. I thought foolishly, first of all, that that was a congregation. The little egg-shaped things underneath is a, is a rocky hill. And it, it might, it's possible that there is, that those of you who know, I, I know will know the Hill of the Angels, and will know that this is a scene of an event in, which is recorded in book three of Adamant's um, Life of Columba, where he goes there with, and, and discourses on top of this little hill with a multitude of angels. And he's, he's spotted doing this. And um, this is Adamant uh, digging him up, basically. And who else stood, stood on top of the hill and received divine wisdom? Well, Moses did, of course. So he's presenting 
um, him as, a, as an Old Testament prophet. And I do wonder if that, that actual scene is being alluded to here. So here's the travels of Columbanus and then wave after wave of Irish and Scottish monks across the continent for hundreds of, of years. Um, and the places that were associated with them on both sides of the, of the Alps. And there's Sam Gal, he was an Irishman, he was one of Columbanus's um, uh, uh, 12 disciples who traveled with them. And uh, Columbanus made it to Bobbio in northern Italy, died in 615. Um, San Gal, he, he was left behind at the place which latterly took on his name. He established a, a cell there and he had an intimate relationship with a, a bear, which is what you can see here, where he gave the bear uh, a loaf of bread in exchange for letting uh, uh, the, the saint use his, uh, his lair. Um, and also, interestingly, Luke's actual that we see in that image as well. And moving on uh, to Reichenau now, the Blessed Land, the World Heritage Site of the uh, German monastic island where the uh, principal copy of the Iona Life ended up, where it was lent St. Gal, which is only about 30 kilometers away into Switzerland from there. And an image of uh, modern day St. Gal, where I was able to go to the Great library there to see the, uh, the book. And there is the Great Rococo Library from the 1700s, which is a spectacular place. It's been one of the greatest libraries in Europe for hundreds of years. And uh, I was, my trip was facilitated by the director of the library, Dr. Dura, uh, in the picture there. And there's part of one of the uh, original catalog pages which describes the uh, a number of the Irish manuscripts. And Irish, of course, Irish is a catch-all for um, Irish and maybe some Scots manuscripts uh, as well, which ended up, ended up here. And within the, the image, it, it started to give up something else as well. On the altar shelf, as well as the, the what looks like a house-shaped shrine, there's uh, an upright um, above it, which I took to be a candle originally, and then there's another object uh, on the far side. And Jane Dennis has suggested that the object on the far side, and here we get another extraordinary circularity as well, is the book. It's, it could be another Irish gospel book. It's a book satchel, probably. Um, and, and this is a key trio of objects interrelated to each other. Um, and we'll see the, the middle one as it uh, develops. Uh, and this is you, uh, uh, definitely a you heard it here first moment. This didn't make it into the paper because the digital processing of the image, which I've been able to do a bit more of just recently, hadn't been done then. This is it. And if you look up there now, to see what's starting to emerge. It's a cross metalwork cross. Presumably also something that was taken with the house-shaped shrine and the book uh, all the way across Europe to end up on the altar of which this is an image of in the church at San, San Gal. And reversed and enhanced a bit more, it then uh, starts to come out very, very clearly. And uh, again, a version of this paper at the International Insular Art conference in Glasgow earlier this year and with very, very good quality um, projection on a massive screen in the university in Glasgow, the cross, components of the cross start to emerge and Sally Foster who um, uh, spotted it uh, in, in the night. But the, the house-shaped the, the house shrine um, seems uh, uh, to emerge quite clearly. It's hipped gables, quite characteristic, three tiers of decoration, the lower of which features three or five mounts, each with a central dot likely to represent a glass stud, um, and a row of what seems to be three smaller mounts indicated above on the sloping rooflet, um, surmounted by a ridge topped with a row of possibly five little uh, upright oval decorative fittings, which are atypical of any other um, insular house shape. Uh, 
So one thing that I started to do, oh, and that's just a bit of, a bit of fun for the, uh, for the cross there, a bit of bling. One thing that I, that I did was, first of all, to look at all the continental examples of ice-shaped shrines from the Merovingian and Carolingian world of the 600s and 700s and the 800s. And uh, coming very quickly to the conclusion that they bear really very little resemblance to the one uh, that's illustrated in the image, but bear much more likely uh, representation to our very familiar objects here, especially the Monimus Welkery, which as I say is a tiny little thing which you can hold in the palm of your hand, um, traditionally associated with St. Columba itself, but David Caldwell uh, showed in a paper in the proceedings a number of years ago that that's very unlikely to be the case. But also the Bologna uh, high shaped shrine there, which to my mind uh, bears, which is a, a, another Irish Pictish object, uh, bears a much closer um, relationship. So, drawing these strands together, uh, the illustration on the last page of Codex Saint Gall 555 is important to its own right as the oldest known illustration of Saint Columba, helping us understand the, light, the lasting devotion to him, as well as to other Irish saints in Central Europe, resulting from waves of immigration by Peregrini monks originating from Irish and Pictish monasteries. In the continental church, uh, Columbus was seen as a spiritual um, ancestor of Columbanus and Gallus. And thanks to the powerful influence of the monastery of St. Gall, the cult of Columbus was spread through the region, where he's commemorated in uh, the liturgical calendars of important churches. And it's recorded that they had at St. Gall, they had um, a relics of Columbus by the time that the uh, little drawing was made. <coughs> The Irish manuscripts at St. Gall and Reichenau, together with the Inchelor High Street Shrines now held uh, in the area of San Salvatore, in uh, Tuscany and Bologna, um, and one from Borneo, show that the Irish monks travelled not only with books, but also with other liturgical objects, together with precious relics in their satchels. The artist of the sketch was a monk who would have drawn an inspiration from things around him, the architectural setting in which he placed the saint is likely to be derived from Columbus Chapel in the monk's own ninth century church of St. Gallen. And the same applies to this depiction of an essential interrelated groups of liturgical objects, shrine box, the cross, and the book placed atop the altar. The church of the famous St. Gallen plan features a proliferation of altars and side chapels driven by the need to accommodate the cult of saints as an essential component of the architecture of the Carolingian church. And just to, to finish off, here we have the earliest surviving image of the saint, albeit in a Carolingian context, a long way from home. By a nice circularity, um, the St. Gallen Library uh, are, are being very interested in the results that Jane Geddes and I have turned up, and we've been invited to give a joint lecture there at the Great Library um, next Easter. And thanks to this illustration, we have another reliquary of St. Columba to add to the list of known and lost Columban reliquaries. The detailing of the left-hand object in the drawing could be interpreted as exhibiting characteristic features specific to insular house-shaped shrines, notably the three over three mounts, typical of some Irish Pictish shrines and entirely dissimilar to continental exemplars. And maybe by proxy, we're even getting a glimpse of how these objects would have been displayed on the altars of our lost Pictish churches. So, from what we've seen, it may be reasonable to suggest that a richly decorated house-shaped reliquary, which housed one or more small portable relics of Columba, was gifted to the great monastery church at St. Gallen to become the star attraction of Columba's altar, which may have been located near that of Columbanus. It's also proposed here that this was an Irish Pictish style house-shaped shrine and a luxury object at that, as befitting a housing for the bones of one of the greatest saints from the Age of Saints, a saint who is well known and popular with the Irish influenced monastic culture of the region and who featured in their literature. Thank you. Thank you very much.
much indeed for that, Peter. Um, tradition demands that we don't actually uh, take any questions straight after the talk. But I, I assume that Peter's not doing a runner and will uh, give me all out there to, uh, to speak to you um, or, or um, engage in conversation. So thank you very much indeed, everybody, for attending. Um, and uh, please stay for the reception, and build yourself of the, of the drink and nibbles. And in the meantime, can I remind the newly elected fellows to come down here in front uh, for a nice group photograph. So thank you very much.